Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the side event of the Statistical Commission of the United Nations. Um, uh, I see that people are joining, so we were just giving a couple of minutes for to people to join, but I see that now we have um, <clears throat> more than 50 participants. So <clears throat> I want to warmly welcome you all to, to the side event, um, which we're very, very happy to have uh, uh, the chance to discuss uh, with all of you um, uh, about uh, two of the working groups that are um, uh, integrating statistical and geospatial information, uh, co-organized by, by the Working Group on Geospatial Information of the Interagency Expert Group on SDGs, uh, <clears throat> that I co-chair with Kevin McCormack, my colleague from Ireland that is also joining us. And uh, we will present uh, in this first part of the side event uh, the SDG Geospatial Roadmap. And I also um, greet and hello to Alex and all the team from the expert group on integration of statistics and geospatial information, which I, I, I used to co-chair. So I'm really glad uh, to be here with you today as well. Um, so uh, just to, to get started, so, so we are going to go through a couple of slides just to give some background about the work that the Working Group on Geospatial Information uh, of the Interagency Expert Group on SDGs has been working on uh, since uh, 2020 when we revised uh, the work program for the WGGI and uh, now we're very glad to have uh, this uh, a geospatial roadmap that will be presented for adoption. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the SDG geospatial uh, roadmap was really envisioned two years ago as a document that would be uh, easy uh, and understandable and uh, something that was light and not like a heavy document that no one would read. But how can we make this something that is really um, uh, that is close to statistical agencies and where we can really uh, uh, showcase the linkage of geospatial information for SDGs. So um, the Statistical Commission um, encouraged uh, better integration of geospatial and statistical information uh, to better monitor the 2030 agenda. And with these, we had uh, a mandate to work on how can uh, uh, we support as a working group of the interagency expert group on SDGs, how uh, can we work uh, uh, together and, and, and help fulfill uh, these, these mandates. So um, the WGGI uh, focused on, on uh, developing this SDG geospatial roadmap. As I said, when, when we revised the terms of reference of the group and what we were doing, we realized that we really wanted to build this document that will build a, be a bridge between the statistical and geospatial community and that really uh, can uh, uh, set uh, the tone for uh, cooperation between these two communities where we really see the value of complementing uh, the work uh, and complementing the global indicator framework. So we can go to the next one, please. Um, well, what, what, how have uh, uh, we carried out these tasks? Uh, so these, as I said, started, um, uh, I mean, 20 years ago uh, for, since the inception of the Millennium Development Goals and, and later with the SDGs. We really uh, realize that we we need uh, data um, to really follow and monitor, and we wanted to close this geospatial divide. So, um, what we want to bring into this roadmap is really to showcase the capabilities, skills, and opportunities that developing countries and not developing countries and everyone that is working on this um, can can bring to the table for the use of geospatial. So the SDGs uh, roadmap, geospatial roadmap, has been really developed uh, to provide actionable guidance to the IAC. As I said um, at the beginning, we want this to be a document that it's not like, 
hard to digest, but it's something that is really uh, close to member states. Uh, so, so we really did like a very inclusive process where we worked with uh, national statistical offices, national geospatial offices, uh, in order to understand what uh, their, their, their limits for using geospatial information is. And we also understood what the best practices are and where we can uh, work together to uh, support the integration or the use of geospatial information. If we go to the next one, please. So, so what's the vision of the, the roadmap? And um, as, as uh, stated before, we, uh, the vision is to see geospatial and location-based information being recognized and accepted as official data for the SDGs and their global indicators. Uh, the purpose of the roadmap is that it's a living source that helps to easily communicate and guide and enhance the awareness of geospatial information, earth observations, and other related data sources uh, to showcase tools, methods to inform and, and, and complement uh, SDGs monitoring and implementation. So um, this roadmap really uh, builds the bridge between these two communities, the statistical community and the geospatial community. And uh, it's uh, organized in three phases. We call the first phase is prepare and plan. The second one is design, develop, and test. And the third one is measuring, monitoring, and reporting uh, geospatially enabled SDG indicators. So um, our, the users are the countries, the member states that need to report. And the providers are regional commissions, SDG custodian agencies, and other experts that have been um, uh, very helpful and have been uh, really good partners uh, in these in the work of the roadmap and, and in, in bringing this roadmap together. Next one, please. So I, I really like this slide because it's not easy uh, to get to this point. And here I want to give a heads up and, and really thank everyone that has been involved in the preparation of this roadmap. Because as you can see in these little uh, uh, drawings in the screen, the roadmap is now available in three, um, in three languages. We have the roadmap in English, Spanish and French available. And uh, we really uh, want um, to you to, to take a look at it because we, we feel that it has a really nice look, but also a very strong content about how to use geospatial information for SDGs. So uh, following these extensive um, uh, conversations with member states, WGGI members, and also custodian agencies, now the roadmap is submitted for adoption uh, to the Commission uh, by the Interagency Expert Group on SDGs. Uh, the roadmap was adopted uh, last fall in the 12th meeting of the IAC. And um, as I said, it's going to be presented in three languages and that, uh, that we hope uh, this helps uh, with the dissemination and understanding. So um, we will also uh, we're also providing a story map of the roadmap because, as I said, we want this to be a document that is easy to read, easy to understand, and uh, this roadmap is an interactive resource that supports the communication of all the material that is here, all the material that was captured in in long. Uh, uh, conversations with member states, and we try to interactively tell a story, tell a story um, in terms of how countries are using geospatial information for SDGs. So I hope that you all can read it. Osamu, we, we're still pending of the Japanese one, but I hope that, that you can help us on that. <laughs> well, and so I think this is the last slide, or is there another one? Um, no, okay. So uh, with this, I finish with the introduction. I, I welcome you, everyone again uh, to this meeting. And now uh, we want to show you a short video in terms of what the roadmap contains and how you can access 
um, the roadmap easily. So uh, if we can run the video, please, Mark. Writing than the PDF documents, but it's, it's more friendly and it's adapted maybe uh, to the, um, the actual current uses of technologies and content in the web. So in the WDGI, we decided to create this friendly version, um, easy to consult, and we decided that it would be in uh, S3 platform, the S3 story map, to help the UNGGIM to host it and make some changes over time because we wanted to be a living document and able to integrate future needs and future solutions, technological and data solutions um, over next years. So it also allows to share it. If you if you click this button, you can have a link, you can share it in social media. You can here print a preview, so you would be able to, to save all the content and also embed the story in your own website or your own story map. Um, because one of the benefits is to integrate different multimedia materials. So here from the menu, you can also navigate through the different sections. We have the executive summaries, the introduction. Here we have the basic definitions. What are Earth observations? Um, what are uh, what is geo disaggregation by geographic location? What is geospatial information? We have here the three phases presented and linked. So phase one, prepare and plan. Phase two, design, development and testing. Phase three, practicing, measuring, monitoring and reporting geospatially enabled SDGs indicators. These little sections in the same way that in the PDF explain how to use and uh, how to make the best use of the SDGs geospatial world map to help all the, the countries to develop and, um, and measure their indicators. Here is a roadmap navigator which makes the link between each key action and phase to uh, these three main thematics that appear during the, the, the large consultation exercises we made with uh, all the countries of the WGTI. So one of the main concerns is the people training and people capacities, so access to technology and governance issues the development of SDGs. So here we can access the three phases. We will just very briefly see one of the phases, so phase one, and see particularly how the multimedia contents are embedded. So in the same way, you can navigate from the menu to the, directly to the different key actions if you are not interested in having a linear reading of the roadmap. You can also here see that uh, S3 Story Map adapts the visualization to your own device screen. Um, so here, for example, we can see another story map embedded within the story map, and you can consult it without leaving the road map. So this is Ireland's SDGs governance story. It also has uh, his own menu. It also integrates its own multimedia materials, so um, a video, pictures, links to reference documents and framework, websites, everything is linked and easy to consult. And this also, um, it's conceptual, conceptualized as a door to uh, a large number of external resources. So this is the idea to embed everything we can. Uh, this is uh, in the section of non-conventional method and data, um, another story map linked on citizen science, a second story map with a country case in Ghana, how Ghana used citizen science to uh, measure marine leisure. So website of citizen science, um, data science, sorry, uh, laboratory at the INEGI. And um, we observe a network of stakeholders and research um, centers, citizen science. So um, in the same way, you tools are uh, linked and you can go to the different phases in this part. Thank you very much.
Great. So I hope with this uh, you've uh, had kind of a, a first approach to the look and feel of, of this story, just the door to all of those resources that are out there, but that now uh, we have kind of this link and a document that is uh, very easy, accessible for all the uh, statistical agencies to use and uh, implement. Well, with this, uh, now I want to um, bring to the floor to my colleague co-chair, Kevin McCormack. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, will, uh, he's been chair, share a bit of um, Ireland's perspective about how they approach uh, the use of geospatial information for monitoring SDGs. So, Kevin, you have the floor. Thank you, Paloma. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody from Ireland. Uh, so, I'm Kevin McCormick, and I'm uh, head of the SDG division in the Centre Statistics Office. Uh, and as Paloma says, uh, I co-chair the WGGI with her. I also have some responsibility on the technical advisory group from the WHO and UN on the COVID-19. Uh, and today, I'll have some discussion about the SDGs and then also the COVID-19 uh, and how those two agendas actually link together through our um, SDG roadmap. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Mark? So, uh, in the previous uh, video, uh, Celine was talking about the governance. Uh, and here in Ireland, we're looking at the governance and the role of the CSO in terms of governance around the SDGs. Um, so, uh, the CSO, well, basically my small team, we're the focal point for the SDGs. So, we coordinate the quests from the UN organizations. Uh, we want to make sure that all the data is good. We use the GSBPM, which I'll discuss uh, slightly later on. Uh, we're looking at identification, management, presentation of the data. We produced our own SDG roadmap. Uh, we also supported the VNR, uh, the Voluntary National Reports for the SDGs. They appear every two to four years. Um, we're actually our data experts, and we reach out to find data experts in the areas that we're not the experts in. Um, and that's where we liaison with the government departments. Uh, our deck here, which is our Department of uh, Environment Communications, our Climate and Communications, so to say, uh, they have the national responsibility for policy of the uh, 2030 agenda. In terms of governance, uh, we have weekly, quarterly, and annual meetings. In terms of the weekly uh, meetings, um, we have a national hub, which I'll speak to um, in the next slide, uh, where we're working with our colleagues from Ordnance Survey Ireland, uh, also our colleagues from ESRI Ireland, um, who are the technical support team, and then uh, what we have done is that we have embraced the federated information, the FIS for sustainability, uh, for sustainable development program. Uh, we see this as an example of both the interagency uh, and public sector private partnerships. Um, what we have done is that we have, so as we've set ourselves a goal to develop and deploy a new approach for monitoring the UN SDGs uh, using geographic information systems. We have a little tag tagline, and our tagline is the geospatial potential of statistical data. So that's the tagline, that's what we're after. Can I have the next slide, please, Mark? Okay, so the foundations of our approach. So what we're looking at here is on the left-hand side, we have the GSPPM. This is for the statisticians, and that is how we organize ourselves. And certainly we're in the CSO in Ireland, this is how we organize ourselves. It's all the different um, information about gain, gaining data, making sure it's clean, making sure it's accurate, making sure it's presented correctly, making sure it can be digested and communicated to users. We're then looking at the, the GSGF, uh, which those who are in the geospatial uh, community are quite familiar with. And that's also we have the IGIF, which is the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. But working myself and uh, Mark, who's the Secretariat here, working with our colleagues in the UNCE on the modernization of official statistics, we were able to actually bring together the GSBPM and the GSGF principles. So this is the beginning of the bridge between the geospatial and the statistical communities. And we can see here that these three frameworks can certainly work together. Can I have the next slide, please? So here, really, the reason I have this slide here is just to, I suppose, to indicate that all the expertise that we have in, in Ireland has been distilled into the roadmap. And really, the next uh, number of slides is around the three phases that we've actually had. It's the example of what you can do if one embraces the actual roadmap itself. Can I have the next slide, please? So first of all, I will discuss the Irish SDG reporting ecosystem. So in terms of getting the data, CSO has responsible for the data. We have our own uh, stat bank, which is a, uh, a repository for data. 
And this, of course, has been built under the GSBPM, so that's the foundation for that. And we also have the GSGF, GSGF, should I say, working in this particular space. So the data comes in. What we have then is that we make sure there's a geospatial identifier on this data. And then what we have done is that we have a national platform. It's our colleagues on the OSI support this for us, and it's on their GeoHive platform. So we can update that platform, and that's at the top. Uh, we can, and then users can also download the data themselves straight from CSO, or they can actually go to the platform and download the data. Also, APIs can be downloaded from our national platform as well. So in that particular space, which is the center one, we're looking at the IGIF there. Then going on, what we're looking at on our national platform, uh, we can visualize visualization in the platform. Uh, here, it's the road deaths that you're looking at in different counties in Ireland, which is the, the areas, uh, these different uh, geospatial regions here. Uh, we have a direct link through our FIS, the UN statistical divisions. Uh, so it's a direct link from our data hub on the GeoHive direct to um, the UN. On, of course, uh, on our GeoHive, we're using the ESRI environment. So there's a direct link through the ESRI environment into the UN hub. Um, but we do know that um, many people are not engaging with the ESRI, um, the ESRI environment. So what we have done is that we've provided a uh, visualization, our tutorials for visualization of shapefiles. We have R tutorials, we have Python tutorials. And here's an example uh, of a tutorial that we have provided where users can actually follow through and look at the, uh, the, the debts, different type, type of debts in Ireland. And you can see that the maps from either the ESRI platform at the very top or the bottom one here using, this is actually R, are quite similar. Can we have the next slide please, Mark? So this is a, a picture of our hub. So we have our, our data hub on the GeoHive. So on the right hand side, you'll see all the goals. Uh, these goals are actually little websites on their own. So each, each, each goal has its own small website. Um, we, it's in a, an, an Amazon cloud, so it's it then that's what we can do with the particular data. Uh, people land on the data here, or I should say on the, the landing page, and they can move their way through the different goals. They can see how much data we have. They can download the data uh, on this particular uh, GeoHive hub as well for the SDGs, which of course is the national platform. We also have story maps. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the governance of the portal, what we're looking at is that we have the UN SDGs. We also have some EU SDGs. We have some national SDGs, and we're also looking at OECD SDGs, and there will also be ILO SDGs. So that's an indication that the pitch is quite crowded in terms of SDGs, uh, but it's their responsibility to identify all the different uh, levels of SDGs for these different agencies, and we will have them on the portal. So users, if they're looking for the UN SDGs, will be able to get them. If they're looking for EU SDGs, they'll be able to get them, and so forth. Um, so the our colleagues in the OSI course manage the technical issues, and we providing the data and they upload the data onto our national hub here. Uh, in terms of our Department of, of uh, Environment, uh, Climate and Communication, uh, they have a responsibility for the content as well. So we're working very closely with the policy people here in Ireland. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Celine in her video was talking about a story map and here's just a couple of screenshots from a story map that we actually have on our hub uh, is the change in pattern of unemployment and poverty in Ireland 2011-2017. Uh, and uh, this particular picture that we actually have here is from Galway, which is a city on the west coast of Ireland, very popular with, stu with students, believe it or not, big university city and tourists. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? So here what we're looking at is story maps. So here we're looking at census, census unemployment rate in 2016. Uh, so the census unemployment rate, we're looking at principal economic status, where people deem themselves employed, unemployed, and so forth. The geographies that we're using here are uh, electoral divisions. There's 3,409 of these particular geographies uh, in Ireland. Uh, so you can see the map at this level, and then if we move to the next slide, please, Mark. Here is an, his, so this is all part of the story map here. Uh, so here we've actually moved into Dublin. Dublin is, is, our, is our capital city and it's on the East Coast. So we're, we're looking at an employment rate. So the darker the color, uh, the higher the unemployment rate, the larger the circle, the higher the number of, 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 of unemployed persons in that particular area. Uh, so um, the, I suppose the wealthy side of Dublin is on the left, is on the south side and you can see them quite quite green, and then you'll see the more poor areas uh, on the north side and then moving out into the west of Ireland. Um, so 
when policymakers uh, are looking at this, they can actually uh, move straight into uh, electoral division, and electoral division is around 300 households. Uh, so that allows our policy members, should I say, our policy makers, uh, to make decisions at a particular local level. Uh, and this is the power of the story map. Can we have the next slide, please? So, uh, so uh, embracing the SDGs, what we're also able to do was develop a network analysis where we measured the distance to everyday services. Um, and we did this, we had released this publication in 2019. We used our census data and we used our OSI prime two road network data. So this is the first time that the two large data sets in this particular space were actually matched together. There's over 2 million households are dwelling, should we say, and the census 2016, uh, and we had over um, 300,000 road segments. And these road segments are at the level of a GDF2. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? So what do you get? Uh, so this is a dashboard. It was actually a story map that we actually built it in, and it is on our GeoHive National Data Portal. So on the right-hand side uh, is a county. This happens to be a county uh, called Carlow in Ireland. You see it's outlined on the right-hand side. And in here, you're looking at the different distances from different uh, services. So we have hospitals, we have police stations, we have uh, supermarkets, we have libraries, and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's very easy for people to see if they're living in a particular uh, county how far these um, uh, services are from, from them. Um, I said it was the first time we actually undertook this uh, network analysis uh, and it's been very well received and it's been used in, in planning. Uh, can we have the next uh, slide, please? On our GeoHive National Portal, what we also have is the ability for self-registration of organizations. So if organizations are undertaking some SDG activities, they can come to our national portal and they can register their activity. They're, when they register, there is a sunset clause, uh, which is 12 months. Uh, so if the activity continues for more than 12 months, they re-register. If not, then it's taken off the, uh, the, the, the data to the front of the page here that you will see the numbers, uh, but it is archived uh, for future work on people can work on it uh, on historical data. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, in addition, what we actually had was a complimentary hub from CSO. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, here is what we're looking at is there uh, from uh, the CSOs, uh, we did, we built the complementary hub. Uh, the rationale for this, of course, was that we want to reach as many users as possible. So we have users who are who are very familiar with CSO products and, and have a touch and feel about the CSO and how you link to data and obtain data. So we have complementary um, CSO hub there. Uh, here is just a little summary of what's actually occurring. Um, so up to the status 2019, of course, that was just before the, um, we had in terms of the pandemic. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see a table. We have 244 indicators. We have sourced data for 211 of them, um, which means that we are pushing the, uh, the, the, the 2030 agenda uh, through these indicators uh, in order for us to be able to source them. Now, of course, what do we do when we source them? So can we have the next slide, please, Mark? So what we do is that we have publications. Now, uh, so we have published uh, 10, publications from go one to 10 and number 11 is going out on Monday. So when you land on the SDG hub page on the CSO on the right hand side, you'll see all the goals. So these are electronic publications where the data is there. We actually, uh, of course, different depart government departments, agencies and offices will have different responsibilities for the different indicators. Uh, we'll, we will engage with those particular departments, offices and agencies from to provide us with some policy input in terms of the uh, publications that we're releasing, and then we have the data uh, surrounding that goal uh, included as well. Can we have the next slide, please? So to grab people's attention, we have the infographics. You'll see here, these infographics are from one to six, uh, looking at number one, there's no poverty. Yet again, you will note that we have the statistics and also the geospatial. So you'll see that we have whatever geospatial element that we can actually get, it will actually be published. Uh, what you're looking at here, for number one is that we have nuts uh, nuts three. Uh, for number two, it's uh, which of course is zero hunger, it's nuts two. Um, coming into number three uh, with good working, it's county level, which is 20, uh, 26, uh, and then moving back and forth. So the key piece here is that to get people's attention, you must have a good communication channel. 
using infographics like this is a good communication channel. We've also found the story maps and the geo hive has been a very good uh, communication channel as well. Can we have the next slide, please? And these are just the final um, infographics that we actually have in terms of uh, affordable and clean energy, decent work, industry uh, innovation infrastructure, and reduced inequalities. Um, so as you see, it's a it's familiar now. You'll see the statistics and the geospatial aspect of these statistics being all presented together. Um, okay, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. Okay. So. Um, so of course COVID-19 happened and we what we had to do was refocus the Irish SDG team to COVID-19. Can we have the, the next slide please? Okay, so basically this slide is telling us that in response to co the coronavirus, okay, uh, the CSO in collaboration with our OSI colleagues and Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government and the all Ireland um, Research Observatory, Aero, in Munich University, along again where Esri Ireland uh, colleagues as technical partners, we rapidly developed a national COVID-19 data hub on the GeoHive platform again. Of course, the GeoHive was identified as the state's geospatial data platform in our public service data strategy of 2019-2023. Uh, we did give ourselves a name and it's the GeoHive COVID-19 Response Coordination Group, uh, a slightly uh, large acronym there. And we have the next slide. So here we go. So this is the ecosystem. So you'll see on the left-hand side, it's slightly different. Once again, the foundations are there at the very top. We have the GSBPM, it is GSGF. We have the uh, GGIM, uh, IGIF, and then so forth on the right-hand side. Uh, so this stage, what happens, we're dealing with health authorities. Um, so our health authorities have never provided microdata to anybody previous to the pandemic. So in the CSO, what we have is a statistics act of 1993, where a director general was able to reach out using a memorandum of understanding with our health colleagues for them to provide us microdata, which we store securely within the CSO. And what we're able to do then was actually push that statistical data up to the GeoHive again, our national platform. And in that national platform, of course, anonymized, uh, we're very clear about statistical uh, disclosure control, uh, and I'm the gatekeeper for this, so it's my job to make sure as the data comes, uh, there is no breaches of statistical disclosure control. So the um, the data is gone to the platform, and that platform then is a visualization again. You will note that uh, we have the visualization here, it's pretty similar to what we have done for the our SDGs. Uh, of course, within the, uh, the GeoHi platform, there are restricted access. So, so there's public access and restricted access. That allowed us, of course, then to do additional work. Um, down on the, the on the second column down, you'll see this is Dublin and these little circles, they're related to road traffic volume past different sensors. So the larger the circle, the larger the volume. So when the lockdowns were on, we were able to provide our Garda Shikana, which is our policing service, with a visualization, a visualization of this. So if there's a large amount of traffic we're in lockdown, different areas, different sensors, this information is coming in in virtually real time, we're able to provide this information to the guards, our police force. On the right-hand side, then, it's the local authority support services for vulnerable people. So this is the dashboard that we built. So there's calls received, calls, cl calls closed, should I say, follow-up calls, and so forth. So you can see it as a mixture. Also then, uh, from the CSO and the, um, and the secure site that we have, we're able to provide the microdata to pandemic modelers. And the pandemic modelers, of course, we're looking at the OR, um, in other one infection rates and, and, and the R figures and so forth coming through here. And they and that information then is also fed to the GeoHive platform for the national hub on COVID-19. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So as we see here, you've seen an image of the public version of the national COVID-19 data hub. Uh, okay, so what we have is that we have the project planners use best practice methodologies and governance structures to ensure the appropriate overall management of the project and its data. Yet again, there's a big governance uh, aspect of this, which we are very much aware of, um, and we, we take uh, due care and attention around that. Uh, what we're then looking at is that, as I said previously, there is an internal version, uh, and it contains additional data, some of it's sensitive. This internal site is only accessible in a secure manner by authorized individuals. So some examples of the data on this internal hub are hospital admissions and discharges by date, age, gender of patients, ICU beds occupied by age, gender, dates of admission and discharge of patients. And this data is available for each hospital in Ireland. Infections reported by geography. This is the census electoral divisions, 3409, which I mentioned. Date, age, and gender. Testing dates of referral, tests, lab results. Also the geography is ED. 
uh, of the individuals, individuals tested is available uh, and we also have the throughput of the testing labs by date. And as we've said, that the CSO has sourced these data from our health executive, health service executive to our Stats Act of 1993. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is a, um, an animation. Uh, so when we're actually communicating uh, to the public what's actually occurring, Mark, I think if you click down the bottom of that, I think it starts it. If you go back, so this is an, an animation, hopefully it works for Mark, um, where it's from the 5th of July to the 1st of November, 2021. I'm not sure if it's working for Mark, is it? If you click the bottom of the actual animation, up should come the player. Maybe it's just gone static. Uh, but I'll talk to you anyway. So these are the uh, the local electoral areas. There's 166 of them. Uh, and here what we have is the 14-day instance rate. Um, and of course, the darker the color, uh, the, 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 the higher the, the, the rates. So what the animation actually does, so Mark, I see your cursor. If you go down to the bottom of that uh, animation, yeah, just go down to the bottom and come across to where you see our statistical office. Uh, no, come up onto the animation page itself. Come up a little bit. Yeah, uh, so just underneath the, um, yeah, so if you hit the picture itself, yeah, if you go onto the animation picture itself, Mark, to the animation itself in the center, yeah, go onto the animation itself, picture of the animation itself, there's a little um, a little button there for it to go. If you hit it, yeah, did it go? No, as, as, you, as you're trying that, I keep talking. So here, it's, it's moving now. So now you see the animation moving. So this is the animation. So what we're doing is providing this uh, on, a, on a weekly basis to our, to our colleagues, and we can see the change in terms of the LEAs over the period of time. Of course, the the lighter, the better, the darker, more challenging that we have. So as the infection rate starts to increase, and you'll see it here, we were able to zone in on different areas um, and actually communicate to the public uh, the difficulties that are there. Of course, this is for the public uh, consumption only. Uh, there is one in the background for the, um, the electoral districts, which is 3,409 geographies. Uh, but yet again, you can see how you can use these tools um, to communicate the information that's coming through. Yeah. Once again, uh, can we have the next uh, slide, please? I think we're just finished. So thank you. I suppose my final uh, takeaway point on this is that uh, all our work and all our experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, statistics and geospatial uh, communities coming together and the ability for us to be able to provide different data hubs in terms of SDG plus the COVID-19 really is distilled into our SDG roadmap, into, into, into the roadmap. And I suppose one message we could say that if you really want to follow what we're doing in Ireland, if you engage uh, with the roadmap itself, uh, you, will, you will have the information on how to do that. Thank you very much. Back to you, Paloma. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, I think that we now go to Sandra Moreno uh, of uh, Colombia. Uh, Sandra, you have the floor. And Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here. Um, I'm going to share with you um, the Colombian experience about the uh, special roadmap. Um, give me a moment. I, I'm going to try to share the presentation. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect time, Mark. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, well, yes, I, I want to share with you the Colombian experience of the implementation of the SDG, SDGs Just Special Roadmap. Um, we are, I want to focus on the three phases of the Just Special Roadmap. Um, please, uh, Mark, can you go to the next slide? So I want to mention our experience about the preparation and plan, about the how to uh, design a strategy to work with different institutions, um, national institutions, and even uh, regional and global institutions. And finally, I want to share with you our experience in, about the dissemination of the uh, SDGs indicators and our experience to use your special information for SDGs. So, um, 
Next slide, please. So, um, first of all, I want to say that for Colombia, um, we have a commitment with the 2030 agenda. Um, because of that, we have been working in, uh, since 2015 in a work plan that helped us to integrate and cooperate with different international and interinstitutional agencies in Colombia. Um, next slide, please. So, um, because of that, uh, and in relation with the phase one about preparation and plan, uh, Colombia created um, uh, with a legislation, uh, Colombia's high level commission. So this uh, highest level commission um, has the objective of preparing and guarantee an effect effective implementation of the 2030 agenda and its SDG. It's important to mention that this um, high level commission uh, helps to facilitate the strengthen the interlinkage across the Colombian government and all relevant institutions and stakeholders including its statistical and special agents. So in Colombia, we have uh, two institutions, the National Statistics Institution and the Geographical Agency. And this high level commission helps to integrate and coordinate the work of this institution and other institutions. So this is a good, um, a good achievement that we have that this um, high level commission to organize the work with all different um, relevant actors. In the next slide, um, I want to mention about the, our experience in the phase two about design, development, and testing. So um, in Colombia, we created a document called COMPASS um, 3918. This document is uh, of, uh, is created in 2018, and this is the strategy of the implementation of SDG in Colombia. And this document has four um, components or four um, strategies. The first is the monitoring and reporting scam. Uh, second, the statistical strengthening plan. Third, the territorial strategy. And third, the non-governmental um, alliance. So this document was very important because it helped to uh, define like a roadmap and a strategy and it helps to identify key sources to prioritize data needs and also helps to identify um, a set of indicators um, classified internal as a prioritized indicators. So we focus all our efforts to um, generate this information about these indicators according with this prioritization and according with the national circumstances. Also, uh, with this document and with this strategy, we work with other um, agencies as the SDG custodian agencies. We work with workshops that help us to understand uh, the methodology, the process, and improve the um, internal process that we have. Um, and finally, we also work with other regional and global entities to leverage available capacity. We developed, um, we conducted uh, workshops with regional countries, for example, share our experience, learn about the experience of other countries, and understanding how uh, with lessons learned we have and how we can improve all this strategy and all this process. So, in, in the next slide, in the next slide, um, I want to I want to mention as an example that of this um, collaborative work that we work with the national that we we work with United Nations to create uh, a guide. Uh, this guide uh, has the objective to provide a set of steps for measuring and monitoring the global SDG indicators. So there are a set of steps 
that um, we create as a recommendation to help to the countries to monitoring the SDGs. So this is a good example of how we can work with others and share experience and has this uh, standardized document. So uh, in the next slide, uh, I want to focus in the third phase. Uh, this phase is about measuring, monitoring, and reporting the special enabled SDG indicators. So I want to mention that in, in Colombia, in Dani, to guarantee the visualization and reporting of the progress, the national entities only report indicators to the National Administrative Department of Statistics Dani, uh, because Dani is the national coordinator um, in Colombia of the national statistical system. So each year we receive information from other entities and thanks to, to co that Dani collect this information, we create a strategy, a strategy to disseminate these um, SDG indicators uh, that we have calculated. And we have also, as Ireland has, we have an ESRI Hub too. This is um, a platform that allows to put available the SDG indicator that we have calculated. And we can disseminate with a geographical context the information uh, that we have and the process that we have at different levels of disaggregation depends on the information that we have for each indicator. So in the next slide, um, I want to to mention that in, in Gdani, we are working, we have been working in projects and pilot projects uh, that helps to uh, use the geospatial information. And definitely we have, um, we, we have, um, we have identified that the geospatial information, the geospatial systems, techniques, methods has a huge potential to uh, reduce gaps of the SDG information in, in the case that we have gaps and helps to improve the information that we produce. And definitely the geospatial information um, is a big source of information to uh, improve the information that we have and calculate new sources, uh, new data that we don't have before. So uh, as an example, for example, we use Sarah image to estimate the multi multidimensional poverty index. Um, we use also other geospatial information to calculate uh, goals indicators from goals 9, 11, and, and others. In the next slides, you can see more details about uh, our process. And um, you can see in, in the next slides that we have. Um, we started with a pilot project um, in, 20, in 2016. Um, we started with, the, with a pilot project to use alternative sources as a satellite image, for example. And we want to identify which are, how we, this information can will be uh, useful for calculate, for calculate, for example, indicator 11.3.1. This project was very uh, was very successful, and because of that, we calculate um, with satellite image and use just special uh, georeference data from the census, but also we use information from the uh, our just special agency that is IGAD, and thanks to the use of these indicators and uh, thanks to the use of these new sources of data, we we. Currently, we have information from the indicators 11.3.1, um, indicator 9.1.1, uh, indicator 11.7.1, and recently we are working in the indicator 11.2.1. All these indicators are, as I mentioned before, are um, based on the use of satellite image, uh, is based on the use of georeference data from the our national census, but also we use other geospatial um, sources of information as the digital elevation model, roads, um, polygons about 
um, parks or public space. So definitely this information is very useful. And in our experience, as a big potential for different, um, for calculate different indicators. Um, um, because of that, we are working in uh, different strategies to disseminate this result and share our experience. Um, next slide, please. So, um, finally, I want to mention that for, for Colombia and for Danny has been very useful uh, to, to share this experience with others and also learn about the world of others. Um, and for the reason, we conducted a workshop with other countries to share this experience and to promote the use of the special information to close data gaps. So, um, the, the previous year, we worked with um, countries in the region and we developed um, a workshop to um, share our methodology to calculate indicators uh, 9.1.1 and indicators 11.3.1 and this is this is very useful uh, to to share this experience and i am uh, i am sure that these guidelines about the special roadmap for SDG, this is other uh, good example about how we can collect good experience collect lessons learned and i am sure that this is important to disseminate these results share with others because um, the knowledge is uh, is built with the um, steps that each person, each institution, um, achieve. So thank you very much. Um, I finally I invite you to 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 visit different links to learn about this experience and receive more details. Thank you very thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandra. And uh, now uh, we uh, go to um, leave uh, Japan. Uh, so, Asamo Achai, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening here in Japan, and then good morning, and then good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Osamo Chai from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and then I'm also the co-chair of the group on Earth Observation EO for SDG initiatives. My talk is more focusing on the EO data provider's perspective because I'm not the National Statistics Office uh, staffs, uh, but so that I think my talk is a relatively different flavor uh, from the, what uh, presented before. But I, I think it is very important to talk uh, because uh, Earth observation and also geospatial information is a more critical, important uh, data sources to uh, in, uh, provide the information or uh, disaggregation information uh, towards uh, uh, SDGs indicators and also the SDG progress to made. So next slide, please. So what uh, I'm going to present is that uh, you know that the, first of all I like to explain about that the Earth observation laws is getting more important in the SDG process, as you know well. But the transforming our world uh, to 2030 agenda for SDG uh, uh, approved uh, to uh, uh, 2015, and uh, as part of the uh, resolution, uh, Earth observation is highlighted uh, and then. Uh, uh, with uh, geospatial information is more important uh, for progress uh, made and also the supporting to the national statistics offices. So based on this, uh, our uh, Earth Observation Committee are getting more involved in the process of this one. So next slide, please. So just showing about a couple of history on Earth Observation contribution to the roadmap. Uh, back into the 2015, uh, as I mentioned about uh, high level document has been approved. Afterwards, uh, you can see on the left hand side is uh, how the Earth Observation Community work uh, towards uh, engaging with SDGs. So you see about the group on Earth Observation Community, we call the GEO, uh, set the priority on engaging with SDGs. 
after that, uh, uh, JAXA, and then uh, together with the National uh, NASA and the European Space Agency, participate to the WGGI as Earth Observation Geospatial Data Experts. So we've been working several years to get uh, how the Earth Observation data to be utilized to the SDG progress to be made. And uh, in our GEO committee, uh, Japan, JAXA, together with the US NASA and also the Mexico Energy Paloma, uh, we co read the EO4 SDG initiative in GEO. So, so this is a really uh, a foundation has been made uh, how the data provider side can make a, make a contribution as well as we are get involved in the WGGI process to make more available for the Earth Observation Geospatial Data Experts uh, uh, linking together. And then uh, we have uh, progress has been made for the EO4 SDG and we provided the consolidated inputs to the WGI roadmap uh, for development. And then uh, and besides that, we have a uh, launch of the new uh, Earth Observation Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements. Uh, you can type the text so that you can easily access to the website uh, that uh, uh, EO4 stages and then uh, co in cooperation with the human settlement UN habitats uh, that has, uh, has already been uh, opened up those toolkit for your access. And you can see on the right side, right hand side, uh, our Japan uh, com communities has also been proactively uh, doing our uh, activities uh, with under the Japanese government of Japan. Uh, uh, in 2016, uh, SDG promotion headquarters has been established under the prime minister uh, uh, all, all species. And then after several years, uh, we've been uh, discussing about how we can engage with our national domestic uh, statistic, statistic office. We discussed with the Minister of International Internal Affairs and Communication called the MIC uh, as a Japan M NSO. Uh, and then they formed a working group to validate the SDGs indicators. So we discussed about and then selected on 15.4.2 uh, uh, Mountain Green Index uh, indicator to compute and validate with EO data and GI uh, data in Japan. So this is a, just the initial step. And uh, we already successfully uh, computed and validated, and uh, those are result of uh, uh, have been published both uh, detailed report and also the story map, uh, which will be explained later. Next slide, please. So I, I just uh, wanted to try to map out what Colombia has already been the same process, how the WGGI roadmap and then map out to the Japan's activities. Hon honestly said, I haven't read the roadmap uh, until today. So I, I read the roadmap today and then uh, prepare for the slides. And uh, as Paloma mentioned, <laughs> this is not in Japanese. However, I think I felt this is very easy to read and uh, to understand about what to do in phase one, phase two, phase three. So, so that you can see about roadmap phase one, prepare and plan. Uh, you see about there are three key actions. I just uh, distributed uh, actions in, in this slides. And, uh, you know, uh, as, as mentioned in Japan, uh, we have uh, already formed a very well-organized expert organization, such as a statistic expert agencies called the MIC, Ministry of in, uh, in, Internal Affairs and Communications. And we also have a scientific expert organization, such as a transdisciplinary federation of science and technology, which includes more than 40 academic conferences to advise how to best use of the EU and GI for disaggregated information in the metadata and the compute indicators. And as data provider, you can see on the right hand side, uh, JAXA as an EO satellite data providers and also the Geosp uh, Geospatial Information Authority of Japan, GSI, provided ge uh, geospatial information in Japan. So under the in uh, this industrial government academia partnerships, uh, meeting on promotion of the use of the big data. Um, uh, MIC uh, uh, has well organized this uh, ecosystem. And there is a working group on, uh, you can see on the central uh, circle, observation data utilization verification working group. Uh, these uh, expert groups have regularly discussed uh, uh, almost once, uh, maybe a three months is uh, about SDG indicator production by using EO and GI. 
And in 2020, 15.4.2 uh, has selected to validate with mainly using JAXA EO satellite data, and the result has been published in the report as well as a story map. In the roadmap phase one, there are three key actions, one and two have already been done. I think three is more standardization activity, I think, and how to transit the data methods to be more uniform way. This point, I think Japan may need to consider more in the future. So next slide, please. So uh, phase two, uh, design, development, and the testing. So there are, uh, there are actually the five actions. And then this slides just only uh, revealed about the first two actions. One is uh, identify key sources to prioritize data needs. And the second one to prioritize focused indicators based on the national circ circumstances and priorities. So uh, in Japan, in, uh, in preparation phase, JAX has already assessed which indicators JAX Earth observation satellite data can be used. There are eight indicators candidates identified for further conservation if JAXA EO data applicable or not. We have not well discussed these indicators with other uh, entities, ecosystem entities in uh, working group in the previous slides. Therefore, our main prioritization is based on availability of JAXA Earth observation data and methodology. So you can see, uh, for example, the 6.6.1 spatial extent of water-related ecosystems. JAXA has already have our global mangrove watch data sets, uh, which is uh, global data. Uh, but however, in Japan, there are not so much mangrove in Japan. Uh, maybe some uh, west, uh, southwest, a small island, a part of that, we have uh, some small mangrove. But globally, there are lots of mangrove data. So we decided to approach to UNEP as a custodian agency, uh, as, uh, for, uh, and then they are really welcome to, uh, you know, uh, the, to, to try to utilize our global data sets and then try to incorporate UNEP, uh, you know, uh, website, web portal to introduce our data set as an indicator, as well as uh, UNEP involved uh, our data set into their methodology documents. So I think this is a, a very nice example for us to talk, to engage with the uh, uh, UN custodian agency. And then 9.1.1 uh, is a rural preparation with two kilometer distance from all seasons loads. So this might be a little bit difficult for us. In, the, in that case, satellite data can only provide information two kilometer distance from all season loads, but not rural population itself. Uh, but also satellite data should be maybe a high resolution in case if precisely load needed to be identified. In Japan, we have already well implemented load uh, data sets, so that satellite data may not be necessary. So that kind of a situation. So this, might, this indicator might be pending for us in utilizing for the Earth observation satellite data. And 11.3.1, this is, I think, ongoing uh, for the after 15.4.2. Uh, we have already finished the 50.2. So now we are working on 11.3.1. Uh, this is maybe a good example to talk, as Columbia mentioned about, this is a huge potential to utilizing the EO and the GI to validate uh, the, and also the producing indicate, uh, uh, this indicator. So we are now working on this as well. And 11.9.1 is a little bit difficult uh, as we need for more high resolution data sets because this is maybe a small area cities and so on and so forth. 4.1.1 is, I think this is uh, one other areas that we can utilize our satellite data as a global basis because there are our, we have uh, ocean color data sets, ocean eutrophication data sets, and then uh, there are uh, many base areas that needs to be a uh, test bed to utilize our satellite data for monitoring for the coastal region. So we are working with our geo uh, arena to a pilot, to establish a pilot project with a Google Earth engine to try to analyze about how the uh, uh, satellite-based eutrophication can be monitored at the coastal region. So this is ongoing. And the next uh, to 15.1.1 uh, and 15.3.1, I think this might be a, a, a huge potential as satellite data is more, can be able to monitor for the forest in the global basis. So I think, uh, but it's a kind of a pending to see how we can uh, potentially uh, to try to uh, as a, as a next phases. 
And now uh, we have finished for 15.4.2 Mountain Green Cover Index. That was a very success and then validated uh, accuracy and also uh, uh, feedback to the FAO indicators. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is actually the results of uh, uh, 50.4.2 and then in linkage to the key actions three and four, commit to convening workshop to promote a sharing knowledge and experiences and also the uh, key action point four, convening workshop with SDG custodian to confirm uh, appropriate data methods and uh, coordinate development uh, uh, suppliers. And uh, uh, because we uh, we have uh, significant uh, you know uh, results uh, activity has already been done in producing for the validation result and then there are a couple of points have been made and produced and then this is a workshop that it's the first time to share our experiences about 15.4.2 validation results. So uh, as you can see, the first spread point. Uh, we found uh, very naturally the high resolution and the local optimized national data sets are valuable for verification of uh, this, this indicator in Japan. Because uh, Japan has a very small geographical area and the complex land use and topography, in that case, a high, very high resolution data set might be very useful to try to estimate the accurate, accurate data sets in, in these in this regards. And then we also found during our, uh, you know, uh, computation, we found some sort of a metadata inconsistency. So, uh, uh, for example, that the wetland into green things, and then but metadata is not saying such. So I think uh, we notified this uh, some this inconsistency to FAO, which is a custodian agency for this this indicator. So they made uh, revision for this indicator as such. So this is a very good, uh, uh, you know, feedback uh, to, to, the, to the national uh, validation case study to the FAO global indicator. So uh, I think this was a very uh, good cooperation. And then now FAO is trying to establish a, a task, uh, have, have already established a task team to refine uh, this indicator for a more accurate basis. And the Japan is participated to this this task team to uh, uh, to engage uh, based on our experiences. So I think uh, we also cover this key action three one four. We're engaged to the uh, custodian agency and also we're engaged to uh, to 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 share our knowledge in this workshop. Next slide, please. Uh, one other thing opportunity I would like to uh, share our uh, experiences. Uh, this is uh, uh, related on the phase two uh, key action five, co collaborate with the regional and global entities to leverage available capacity. Uh, uh, we, as I mentioned, uh, we have a group on earth observation. Oops, uh, come back. Uh, the previous one, slide. Can you come back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then uh, we have a geo community. And then in the Asia Oceania region, we have an AO geo regional uh, uh, community. And then uh, we have organized a, 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 a symposium in the 2021 March. And the one of the special session organized in terms of the SDGs, how the EO community and also the statistic community have been, uh, can be engaged. And I co-chaired with uh, famous uh, Dr. Gemma van Haldelen. Uh, who used to be at the SCAP for the statistics director. And then uh, we invited the three uh, Asia uh, uh, statistic office representative from the, uh, you know, Malaysia, Mongolia, and Fiji. So we have a very nice discussion, first engagement. Oh, I, I, saw, I saw a Paloma, so maybe time is maybe up. So I speed up. So maybe next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is just only phase three. I, I just uh, try to finish uh, very quickly. Uh, so uh, yeah, in this communication, how to uh, disseminate our result is uh, based, uh, we have a Japan SDG action platform. We will already uh, put on the validation report on this website, as well as we put on the MGCI uh, based on the earth observation data sets in, in this website you can access. We also uh, develop our story map, Japan's experience 15.2 which will be uh, uh, linked to the roadmap itself and also hopefully to share to the other uh, platform as well. So next slide.
So uh, this is my just final slide about, uh, I think we feel uh, from our observation community perspective, this is a, a huge opportunity for integrating statistic information, geospatial information, uh, our observation satellite data. So we really need to more engage to the United Nations custodian agency as well as the National Statistics Office. I think we just uh, begin about uh, one of the indicator. We are continuously uh, try to work with uh, those entities and the stakeholders to be more efficiently and then proactively in the future. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Osamo, for, for your time. We know it's late in a Friday evening in, in Japan. So thank you for joining us. And, and of course, for all the substantive work that you've done uh, and to contribute to the roadmap, really, um, I mean, your work and the work that we also co chaired together in eo for sdgs is, is very valuable for, for for these efforts. So so it's really, uh, I will, I'm very happy to see you in this event, your participation, and thank you for sharing all of that knowledge. Uh, so I just want to encourage everyone to use the chat for questions for the matter of time. We, we won't have time to open the discussion uh, our friends of, of integration of statistics and geography are eager also to share their, their work. So please uh, use the chat if, in case you have any questions for the panelists. So now uh, we're going to go to our last uh, speaker, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, he's uh, uh, our colleague and co-worker of the WGGI since a long time ago, Mr. Lorenzo de Simon. He's from the Food and Agriculture. Uh, so now um, Lorenzo uh, will uh, reproduce this video. Please go ahead. Mm, Mark, I don't know if it's only me, but I'm not listening anything so we might be having some technical issues mm -hmm. i think that may be the case blimer if you just give us a, a brief second otherwise uh, we could uh, move to uh to our isgi colleagues and then we uh, present this at the end i think that's probably the best way forward given the time that we have so if we could move to uh, alex mudabetti uh, the co-chair of the ISGI, that would be really good. Thank you. Alex, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, thank you, Paloma, Kevin, and the team uh, for your wonderful presentation. Um, my name is Alex Mudavetti. I want to uh, Yes, my name is Alex Mudavet. I work for the Namibia Statistics Agency, and I'm the uh, co-chair for the expert group on the integration of statistics and geospatial information. I just want to um, uh, alert you that there could be some uh, background noise. Uh, we are experiencing a cyclone Bisarai, and uh, we are now experiencing heavy rain uh, here in Namibia southwest of uh, of africa now the expert group is, is composed of uh, statistical and geospatial integration experts from uh, national statistical offices and national uh, geographic Inform uh, information agencies there are 29 members uh, and five regional uh, committees uh, three un agencies and four international organizations this is the composition of the, the expert group. Uh, the report, we report to both the Statistical Commission and uh, UNGGIM. Next. Yes, uh, so our uh, uh, presentation is on the output. Uh, I think I could say the second uh, major output on the uh, global statistical geospatial uh, uh, framework in terms of uh, the implementation guide. Uh, we are going to uh, just highlight on a higher level uh, the content of that particular uh, implementation guide. But uh, you can continue. 
Yes, uh, before we uh, uh, continue, I just want us uh, to reflect on our work plan 2020-2022, uh, which had uh, divided our work into work streams and task teams, and then the added uh, uh, work on COVID and also uh, the interlinkages uh, to uh, the IGIF. Now, our work streams, there are two work streams, uh, no, three work streams where we were supposed to uh, come up with scoping papers and that were, we're going to constitute the uh, the guide, the core of the guide. And then the task teams on confidentiality and privacy, the task team on capacity building were also supposed to uh, produce outputs that were going to be part of uh, the, the guide. I'm going to later present to you uh, the scoping, uh, the, the part of the guide on geocoding. And then the ultimate goal of the whole ar work arrangement was to come up with a single document that consolidates uh, guidance for member states in implementing the GSGF. And this uh, document was to be submitted to the Statistical uh, uh, Commission. Then uh, added to that was to also look ahead and uh, come up with a new work plan for 2022-2024. So this is the framework uh, uh, in which our current work plan was organized. The uh, three documents before the commission that we've submitted now to the commission are uh, the final results from the global survey on the readiness to implement the global statistical geospatial framework, the uh, GSGF implementation guide, and the expert group work plan for 2022-2023. Uh, so these are the three uh, documents that we've, uh, we've submitted and uh, to the agenda of the Statistics Commission. Uh, next. Next slide. Um, in terms of the implementation guide, uh, this emanated from uh, the Statistic Commission decision uh, 51 stroke 123, and also GGIM decision 9 stroke 106. I think we uh, are aware of those decisions where uh, there were calls to uh, at least come up with guidance material for member states in, in implementing uh, the GSGF. So the output, which is the guidance material, is just a result of those decisions. Next. Uh, the GSGF uh, implementation guide, um, in terms of the, the structure, the core of the guide are uh, the work streams, the work that came through our work streams, implementing geocoding, implementing common geographies, fostering interoperability and ensuring privacy and confidentiality. Then we've looked at technology of the integration of statistical and geospatial information, experiences in terms of uh, uh, national uh, experiences. We have 13 national experiences in the guide, uh, five regional experience. Uh, its experiences as well. So this is the structure of the implementation guide. Next. Okay, uh, you can go back. Um, you can go back to the last, okay, the previous slide. I, I just want to um, uh, highlight that we have changed uh, the order of presentations uh, where Peter Mathi is going to do a presentation on common geography. Uh, then I'll come back to do the presentation on, on geocoding. The, the, the reason is because he has another engagement just uh, immediately after his presentation. So uh, bear with us. Uh, uh, Peter, is, the floor is now to you. Thank you, Alex. And I do have a hard stop coming up very soon. So my name is Peter Murphy. 
I'm the chief of uh, geographic concepts standards at Statistics Canada. And the reason why I have a hard stop uh, very soon is we, we published our first set of uh, counts, if you will, for our census this past Wednesday. And I'm a media spokesperson for the geographies of the census. And in Canada, there typically are many questions about uh, the data, of course, coming out, which are basically the pop and dwell counts, but also the geographies that are that we use. So go to the next slide. So I just thought this is really just a, a brief introduction of principle three and how um, how it's described, if you will, in the implementation guide. Um, I'll go right to what is what are common geographies. There are really two broad types of common geographies. There are geographies defined in law and regulation or constitution. Uh, these would be examples of these would be subnational major political regions, for instance, like states, uh, provinces, or départements. Electoral districts and, and, of course, municipalities, uh, lower and upper tier or local or uh, regional governance, if you will. People tend to, we often call them or uh, classify them as administrative geography. The other broad type of geographic area uh, are defined by a set of rules or methodology uh, that, are, that attempt or uh, attempt to define or, or outline or delineate uh, a geographic concept such as metro region, um, labor market areas, self-contained labor market areas, uh, statistical grids increasingly, and different scales um, or sizes of uh, small area dissemination geography. These geographies are typically uh, termed or viewed as statistical or geospatial. Now, the GSGF and, and the implementation guide uh, that Alex uh, spoke to. Um, encourages the adoption um, of common geographies or geographies of these types um, within statistical uh, integrated I should say integrated statistical and geospatial systems um, and in doing so the following objectives may be obtained and it is the case uh, enhanced capacity to produce aggregated and and as mentioned in first presentation disaggregated data and indicators for domestic purposes and data use uh, to meet moder monitoring and reporting needs uh, in support of or for national objectives, uh, global and regional indicator frameworks. And we heard, we, we heard uh, quite a few excellent examples and description of the SDG uh, uh, goals. Senda, I'd, I'd like to mention, of course, national censuses and other statistical programs too. And lastly, to address emergent and persistent challenges, uh, pandemics, uh, disasters as they occur for countries and regional and international agencies. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Mark. Or... So here I thought uh, I'd just briefly touch on a few key points that are outlined in the implementation guide for principle three of the GSGF common geographies. Yes, there is a continuing need for country specific dissemination geography. The other, uh, so the other point I thought I would make today is that new or proposed uh, dissemination geographies or common dissemination geographies should be viewed as congruent, complementary, or adjunct to existing geographies maintained by national statistical agencies, mapping agencies, and geospatial agencies. And in fact, uh, as new proposed uh, common or dissemination geographies uh, come about, if you will, they can often inform uh, the geographic areas and concepts and standards that uh, our respective agencies uh, have maintained over over sometimes over decades or even recently. Uh, and I'd like to sort of parenthetically mention that there are some uh, regional and international um, newer, if you will, ge geographic areas or common geographies that uh, are probably uh, would probably fit that sort of description that I've just given. Um, the other key point, and, but not the only one, would be that the use of common geographies within statistical uh, production, the, the statistical production process ensures that statistical data is uh, spatially or geospatially enabled, whether it's in graded form, um, administrative, or uh, statistical boundaries or geographies. Key part of that, though, is to build and sustain the capacity and then essentially to move the data or we have methodologies that enable the transformation 
of geospatially enabled uh, statistics and, and data uh, among or between these types of geographic areas. We saw, I, I saw, we saw some very good examples this morning uh, of that in action, if you will. Last point I thought I'd make today is that um, the nature of common geography means that there, there can be and there are a lot of uh, stakeholders involved in their production, analysis, and use by our different national and, and I would say regional and international organizations, if you will, and other institutions. Be part of that, though, I must say, uh, and that's something that I'm responsible for within my organization, is um, how strong is the institutional and, and if you will, uh, standards-based uh, uh, review uh, and, and, and evaluation of whatever happens to be the existing set of uh, uh, standard or official geographic uh, geographic areas or common geographies or dissemination geographies uh, to ensure that they still are relevant. Uh, I think that's an important point. And as uh, different um, countries uh, move through uh, the process of adopting new ones uh, or not, uh, that's an important element, which would also include a consultation. So with that, uh, Mark and Alex, uh, I'd like to conclude my quick presentation on common geographies uh, uh, with regards to the uh, GSGF implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, now, another component uh, is uh, geocoding, which is uh, one of the principles of the GSDF. Now, if you look at the GSDF, the relevant uh, principles for uh, bringing in geocoding is principle one, the use of fundamental geospatial infrastructure and geocoding. Principle two, geocoding unit record data in a data management environment. Those are the relevant principles of the GSGF on geocoding. Uh, but we've uh, made the, the guide uh, very simple such that even developing countries like my country will find it much, much easier to uh, understand uh, what the GSGF really entails in terms of geocoding. So what is geocoding? Of course, many uh, people prefer uh, to use descriptions of locations instead of coordinates to navigate uh, to their environment for instance, an address, you're given an address instead of a coordinate, which is uh, a coordinate may be more technical than an address. Then, uh, and we understand that modern uh, geospatial technologies uh, depend on absolute position, despite us really understanding more of uh, addresses, uh, textual addresses of our places or, or our buildings or our, or, or our, uh, our landmarks within our countries. You can go to the next one. Now we are we are saying uh, geocoding in a simply a simplest uh, way is just a method of linking a description of a location to the location's measurable. Uh, position in space. So linking unreferenced location, such as that textual data, which could be an address or other uh, location or description uh, to uh, a coordinate. Next. This is just an example uh, of uh, linking statistics to, to geography, how's housing uh, unit in rural Namibia 
where a record from a village register is linked to a coordinate, uh, the resulting coordinates are the geocodes. So you can see at the bottom there your XY coordinate or latitude longitude coordinate of uh, your housing unit. Next. Now, in a more formally uh, uh, manner, the, the definition for geocoding could be uh, geocoding is generally defined as the process of geospatially enabling statistical unit records or other non spatial data. This is probably more technical, uh, such as address lists or housing units by creating X and Y. Uh, coordinates and potentially Z coordinates as well, and linking them to uh, each record. Uh, once geocoding is performed on individual statistical unit records, we are saying this can now be uh, aggregated in a larger uh, geographic uh, areas. And I should indicate that uh, here uh, the statistics can be now generated for any uh, geographic boundary, um, especially when we highly disaggregate statistics at X, Y level. Uh, records ready for further applications such as methodologies to ensure confidentiality and uh, avoid data uh, disclosure can now uh, be implemented as well. Okay, next. But then uh, people may be asking why geocoding and we've given justification by uh, 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 geocoding and uh, one of the justification I just mentioned earlier. Uh, we want to foster the greatest opportunity to reuse and aggregate statistical data. Uh, aggregation and disaggregation of associated statistical data by uh, geospatial location becomes very, very possible when we geocode uh, uh, our, our statistics. Now, you may recall that the GSGF uh, document states that all statistical unit records should include or be linked to a precise geographic reference. This was a recommendation uh, made in the document. Uh, X, Y uh, coordinates, if not the smallest geographic area uh, possible. Now, that, that recommendation, of course, was made uh, in 2018. And we are saying as an expert group, this is uh, reiterated in 2021. Okay, next. How can uh, records be geocoded? We've also given uh, some guidance there. Uh, modern geocoding processes are largely automated, of course, uh, through uh, softwares, matching captured data with a base with some inbuilt spatial intelligence to improve uh, the matching process. But we are saying uh, efficiency of geocoding uh, therefore relies on a comprehensive reference database of addresses, uh, location in terms of X, uh, sorry, and location in terms of X and Y coordinates. Uh, this also uh, 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 determines, for instance, the method of geocoding you're going to use. Now, the two components, the two uh, uh, items here listed, those are the uh, major components or components of a mature national spatial uh, infrastructure. So geocoding should be seen uh, within all these uh, uh, frameworks. The geocoding also help, helped uh, by having a standardized uh, structured description of a location. For instance, a uh, street address contains a number of specific elements with formatting requirements. Well formatted requirements, geocoding becomes very, very, very possible. Next. How can uh, geocoding be done? For instance, geocoding can be generated uh, directly. Uh, through coordinates uh, uh, for a specific statistical unit record. 
or indirectly when they use an internal point of a geographic uh, area. Uh, conceptually, uh, most accurate geocodes are the XY coordinates as we, indica we indicated and assigned to a statistical unit at time of collection. Equally specific uh, geocodes are assigned using specific standardized structure, uh, structure IDs, or even uh, within structures like your apartments, for instance, your numbering on your apartments or your house. The next uh, most specific geocodes are for addresses or standardized parcel IDs. Next. Now, as we indicated, a geocode can also be uh, generated through uh, internal uh, points, such as uh, centroids uh, for any functional area uh, where uh, x, y, co exact x, y coordinates cannot be generated. We should, we are taking uh, note that geocoding must be consistently documented uh, for, for each statistical unit in a data, data set along with a corresponding record of a time and a date for each record when each record was geocoded. Next. This is just uh, giving an example of uh, uh, going back, back to the expert group's recommendation in 2018 uh, of using XY coordinate. Uh, this is just an example for, from, from Namibia where we uh, uh went on board with that particular recommendation and structured our methodology for uh, uh for census preparation and what what you see there are uh are geocodes of uh, households and businesses uh in in, in uh, a visual form next this is just uh showing the uh, common geography, the, 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 the statistical units and geocodes inside those statistical units. We use uh, enumeration areas. So uh, these geocodes now can, can uh, be visualized and even aggregated at any uh, geographic boundary, uh, whatever statistical information is collected. Next. Now, what are the uh, enabling uh, resources uh, to facilitate geocoding? We, the main one is the IGIF, really, the nine, nine strategic pathways uh, of the IGIF. And you saw in my introduct introductory slides, uh, we indicated that, that, that the interlinkages with the IGIF uh, as it empowers uh, the GSDF. You can see from the uh, 14 global fundamental geospatial data themes, uh, those that are specific uh, to geocoding, uh, the X, Y coordinates as I've, uh, I've indicated, the addresses and the functional uh, areas. So these are the key uh, uh, fundamental data themes uh, for geocoding, uh, particularly principle one and two. This is uh, next. This is just some uh, further uh, uh, readings on, on geocoding. And this is uh, the end of that particular uh, chapter. Next, uh, I want to, to invite um, Horacio uh, just to give us a, a, a regional uh, perspective, uh, a regional example of implementing the GSGF. Uh, he is going to present the experiences of the uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, over to you, Heracia. Thank you, Mr. Mugabeti. Uh, please, can you share my presentation? Uh, 
Sorry. Can you share my presentation, please? Working on getting that presentation up for you now, Horacio. My apologies. Maybe if you introduce yourself, we can just get it there. It's coming now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Horacio Castellaro. Uh, I am a geographer and, and a SDI specialist, and I work at the statistical division of uh, ECLAC, UN ECLAC, the, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean of the United States, the United Nations. Uh, we can go to the next. Uh, in this minute, I will talk about an example of the adoption of the statistical or the global statistical spatial framework in the Latin American region. The development account are funds to strengthen Latin American country capacity related to development policies. In this case, the development account 13 has a spatial chapter, which objective is the adoption of the GSGF in target country. At ECLAC, we of, often work with national statistical offices, but in this project, we are working also with national geospatial agencies. We can go to the next slide, please. These are the target country. We will progressively add new countries from the region to this project. Please, can we go to the next, next slide, please? I'm going faster. <laughs> uh, the project uh, baseline uh, was established by the global survey from the expert group of the uh, on the integration of statistical and geospatial information to diagnose readiness at the country level for implementing the GSGF. So we are really want to thank the working group for this valuable income, and we we are focused in these three aspects. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the outcome we are expecting in this project uh, for each country is uh, capacity building for the implementation of the global for the GSCF, another standard methodology that facilitates integration and interoperability. Please, the next one. And how do we measure the success of this project? Well, in at the end of the project, each country should acquire the capacity for the adoption of a geocoding methodology, use of common geography, implementation of policy. Uh, they, they should uh, implement the national agreement which, uh, between a uh, statistical and geographic uh, agency. They should uh, uh, build a roadmap that describes the action to integrate the statistical and geospatial information. And finally, uh, they should make a, a pilot geospatial platform to show the statistical integration disaggregated and linked to the COVID-19 via IUX. Please go to the next one. As we can imagine, the concrete action for this project are trainings and technical assistance in several subjects, such as geocoding, common geography, automation of geospatial processes for the creation of statistical data, and observation, and so on. But we want to highlight one particular outcome from the different interviews we had with technicians and technical leaders from the national agency. They are demanding the involvement of decision makers through the activity, a high level conference on the importance of global frameworks and the importance of geographic information and informed decision making. We found this interesting. Uh, they recognize this involvement as crucial for the process of adoption of the global framework. At ECLAC, we think international frameworks are fundamental to accelerate the geospatial management capacity on the countries. That's why we are pleased to uh, we are pleased for the release of this implementation guide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for that presentation. Next, um, I'm going to question of the results of the global survey to diagonize readiness at the country level for implementing the GSGF. Um, this. Thank you very much, Alex. 
Um, just checking with John Christian. He had some technical problems. I don't know if he has been able to solve it. So just give him a few seconds to, to test his microphone. Okay, it seems he's not able to uh, access the microphone, so I'll 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 make the presentation for for the both of us. So, meanwhile, Mark is uh, rigging the presentation. Uh, my name is Jarek Moström. I'm from Statistics Sweden, and my colleague Jon Christian Undelstvedt from. Uh, Statistics Norway, uh, we have been co-leading this uh, task team on capacity building uh, within the, the global expert group. So we will make a super compressed presentation on the results from the global so able to scratch the surface because the results are quite extensive actually. So please Mark, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, good. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody finally found the solution to yeah, yeah. open great. the microphone. But uh, I have no access to a camera, so uh, you'll not see my happy face. Well, uh, maybe I should uh, take the intro on the background then, Jakob? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Well, um, the expert group uh, proposed uh, a global survey for two reasons. Uh, one being the, the need to understand the level of awareness of the global statistical geospatial framework and the integrated geospatial information framework within and among member states. Uh, and also to know more about the national and regional circumstances for statistical geospatial integration. That could be capacity concerns and other obstacles. Uh, and they also expected the survey outcomes to provide valuable insight for further work in the expert group. Um, the survey was launched in March 2021 on the margins of the 52nd session of the Statistical Commission in a digital survey tool. And the, in, the content in the survey was uh, informally translated into and um, welcomed responses in the six UN languages. And I would like to thank uh, the, 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 the translators. I know some of them are present here at this meeting, and I would say a huge thank you to those uh, that uh, contribute to the translation of the, of the content in the survey. Um, the survey was disseminated in close cooperation with the, the regional focal points and the regional committees of the UNGJM. Next slide, please, Mark. Uh, some of the conclusions that we can draw from the survey. Now, this is definitely scratching on the surface. Uh, there's a good balance between the responding organizations with just slight overweight for the NSOs. And there's also a high degree of coordinated responses. That means that the statistical organizations and the geospatial information agencies cooperated on a, on a common response to the, the survey. Uh, but there are significant regional differences in the response rate, as you can see from the table at the bottom of this slide. And there's an underrepresentation of uh, low and middle income countries and the bias towards member states with an active involvement in the activities around the expert group. So um, I think I'll leave the next slide to, to Jarke. Thank you. Yes. Um, so one, one section of the of the survey was was targeting the awareness and the usefulness of of the GSGF and the IGIF. So now the when we launched the survey, the the frameworks uh, were out there for a, for a period of time, and we wanted to check if if member states are aware of of the frameworks and what what they think of it in terms of usefulness, etc. So what we found was that the awareness of both the GSGS and the IGIF were, were okay. Uh, not great, but not bad either. Uh, it's, it's been quite 
broadly recognized uh, across all regions. Uh, what we also found, and something that was not very surprising perhaps, is that the GSGF seems to be more uh, well settled, settled among NSOs, uh, whereas the IGIF were more found uh, the awareness of the IGIF were were greater among uh, NGIS, so this was something we we expected, but it, it was also confirmed by the survey. Um, we didn't find uh, any distinct regional differences in in level of awareness across regions. Uh, we can see that there is a higher awareness in, in the Americas and in Europe versus other regions. But it's also difficult to, to um, compare because the low response rates from some regions. So it, it, it very much depends on which countries from, from the regions that have responded to, this, to the survey. Uh, one thing that was really nice and positive, positive thing to see was that there was a really a solid appreciation of, of the GSGF. Uh, the usefulness of the framework was ranked really high across all regions. So that was, that was nice to see. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, another section of the survey was targeting organizational aspects. It was about data infrastructure and um, issues related to this. So what we found out was that there seems to be a quite high degree of, of operational national spatial data infrastructures. And also, at least according to the respondents, there is uh, working relationship between the NSOs and the NGIAs uh, in member states. Uh, we also found that uh, access to fundamental geospatial information was not reflected so much uh, as a significant problem, perhaps as we kind of expected, but it, it was lower rated as an obstacle than we expected. Uh, we could also see a lot of positive reports on the maturity of data infrastructures and data management environments in, in uh, member states. So, for example, infrastructure for geocoding, for geographies and things like that. Anything that was mentioned by, by Peter and, and Alex before. It, it seems, according to the responses, it's, it's, it's working quite well in, in many countries. Uh, we could also see a significant momentum towards a fully geocoded census uh, data in, in member states uh, around the globe. So, for example, if you look at the, at the graph to the right, 33% uh, uh, of, the, of the respondents were saying that, yes, we, are, we will be able to, uh, to capture and, and geocode unit record data in our next census to X and Y coordinates, or we will be able to, to use direct collection of X and Y coordinates using, for example, mobile devices. And if we put these together, there is a very high degree of, of responding countries that, that are able to use uh, a point-based uh, method for geocoding census data, just like Alex were, showing in his presentation. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and then we had a section where we tried to figure out uh, in terms of, of different statistical domains, where do we have the most mature implementation of, of geospatial data and geospatial technology in the, stat in the statistical production? And uh, uh, the responses show that it's within the social and demographic statistics domains that we see the most advanced use of, of geospatial data and, and technology. So it's 
it's obvious according to the to the responses that that uh, organizations are using it for more advanced purposes it's not only making maps but also some advanced uh, processing and on the other hand we can see that uh, economic statistics and other statistical domains are are lagging uh, behind a bit so and maybe it, it's perhaps what we expected that demography and social statistics are, are really relying on, on census operations and this is where we probably find the most mature use of, of geospatial. Uh, we had a couple of questions regarding obstacles to data integration and um, the, the, the options that were top rated was a, maybe not so surprising but it was lack of funding it was also mentioned uh, poor coordination between data custodians and also lack of data interoperability. Uh, there were a couple of other obstacles uh, as well, but these were the, the ones that were rated highest. Um, something else that was, was interesting to see was that around 50% of all the respondents report that they already use admin data in in regular production of geospatially enabled statistics and that was also positive and interesting to see yes we can go to the next slide yeah finally we had a, a section uh, around need for guidance need for capacity building and training and in all these questions we we could see a a strong general request for, for example, for further guidance. And we couldn't see a clear priority between, for example, GSGF principles or elements of data integration. So the message from the respondents seems to be that there is a need for guidance uh, across all elements of data integration. So there are, there are no particular issues that they would like to stress for guidance, but rather the, the whole of, of, um, uh, of the process. And uh, when we asked about the type of guidance that they prefer or request, so we could see uh, some emphasis on, on technical level guidance. So for example, guidelines and manuals. Uh, and we could see that close to uh, Seventy percent of the respondents uh, considered this very useful or close to very useful. Um, and again, uh, a general request for capacity building. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on on assistance to raise awareness among decisions uh, decision makers on the benefits and the value of statistical use spatial integration. So this seems to be a uh, a problem in many countries that they people working in in NSOs or in new spatial agencies may not feel that they have the support they they would like from from decision makers. So this was really stressed. We could see that in the responses. Uh, we could also see that there was a general request for training. Um, there, were, there was a, a special emphasis on use of Earth observation data to general, uh, generate statistics. Uh, so 70% of the respondents, they, they consider this very urgent or close to, to urgent. So that is, uh, I would say, a clear message on priorities from responses. All right, we can take the next and the final slide, I think. Yeah. So um, we made a report for the UNDIM 11 in August uh, last year, and, and we call this the preliminary result. And that was because of, of the response rate was quite low. But after that, we, we had a, um, a number of, of um responses uh, registered so we 
could improve, especially from some of the regions uh, like Africa and the Arab states. Uh, so the, the um, response rate was very much improved, but it's still quite low in some, some regions. So we consider this final result as still a bit biased towards a best case scenario. We know that there are countries that did not respond. And if they had responded, we, we would probably seen a bit different response pattern. And as we see it, lack of response is also probably a lack of capabilities because we, we think we are not, ha, have not completely been able to describe the reality of, of the countries that has the most urgent needs. So that's something we, we have to consider when we, when we draw conclusions from the responses. And uh, again, the result uh, clearly, clearly reflects a very strong request for further implementation guidance. Um, so this is something that, that comes from from all regions, basically, not not from not only from member states that that um, are very mature in their data integration efforts, but all from from all all regions and all kinds of member states, really. So uh, this is um, also a clear uh, direction, I would say, for the for the coming work of the expert group. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thank you very much, Jenka and uh, Johan, for the presentation. Um, we, I want to just thank the team, uh, the team leaders and the entire expert group for uh, pulling uh, the work such that we are now submitting our outputs to the statistics uh, commission. Uh, the document uh, just presented by Yenka and Yon uh, is part of the background document for the report. So it, it has been shared, Mark has shared it I'm not sure whether there are any questions here, uh, but I would love, like to pass on to the FAO for their video. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lorenzo De Simone. I'm a technical advisor for Geospatial, and I work in the office of the chief statistician of FAO. And today I'd like to talk to you on how uh, the experience of FAO has helped inform the design process of the SDG Geospatial Roadmap. And now uh, FAO is using it, uh, is supporting actually countries to implement it. Uh, so first of all, uh, the SDG Roadmap is divided into three uh, main phases, as we know. And the first phase is the data preparation phase, the second phase is the institutional arrangement phase, and the third phase is the actual uh, production, measurement, uh, and monitoring and dissemination of the SDG statistics. So I'd like to show you how this stepwise process has been actually implemented by FAO uh, for the case of the SDG 15.4.2, also called the Mountain Green Cover Index. So first of all, the, uh, the definition of the indicator is very important for our presentation. So the mountain green cover index is defined as the green mountain area uh, over the total mountain area. So in this context, the data preparation consisted in identifying which are the geospatial data that can be used to actually measure the nominator and the denominator of the equation. And uh, those identified layers were actually the land cover maps, so for the denominator and the digital elevation model uh, for the denominator. Such data uh, required some uh, pre-processing, so some preparation and specifically reclassification, uh, as it's shown in this uh, in this workflow. The second step of the roadmap is really the institutionalization. So, how do we communicate this with countries? 
And in this context, during the uh, uh, 2020, FAO has been supporting the uh, foreseen triangular reporting cycle. Uh, so we've been supporting countries, reporting countries, and we've been communicating about the methodology that could be used, uh, which is based on geospatial data. So providing information on how the indicator was calculated and advocating for countries to use their own geospatial data sets, so their own uncover map and digital elevation model. But of course, if you also advised on the, on the use of global data sets for those countries which did not have their own uh, national data set. Uh, and the global data set that have been advised for it that, at, at that time were the uh, European Space Agency uh, land cover time series and the GT Topo 30 digital elevation model. In its third step, then, uh, uh, FAO has helped then countries in the actual computation of the indicator and the dissemination uh, of the statistics. So we've been uh, sharing uh, uh, web GIS maps of the indicators, uh, visualization tools, and the uh, and the actual tabular uh, information. So those are the, the three main steps that are really the three main phases of the geospatial roadmap that FAO has been actually following de facto for supporting the reporting of uh, SDG 15.4.2 in the year 2020. Now we are approaching the new reporting cycle. Um, a last uh, topic I'd like to discuss is about the potential of geospatial data to actually improve the definition of the indicators. And in this case, the indicator uh, that uh, we're referring to is still the Mountain Green Cover Index. And essentially, by leveraging on the SIA classifications and by leveraging on the land cover change analysis, we can improve the sensitivity of the indicator uh, the, the sensitivity to degradation and this to respond to some comments that were raised by some reporting countries regarding the low sensitivity of the indicator to phenomena such as encroachment of agriculture into forests, uh, the appearance of green vegetation where once were perennial ice or perennial snow as a result of global warming and also the different value of uh, a natural versus artificial vegetation to the uh, mountain uh, ecosystem health. So in this context, geospatial data can actually provide an answer to that. And uh, with a view now on the, on the geospatial roadmap process, so what's, uh, um, uh, what's, what's, what's happening is that FAO as a technical agency is, is testing and experimenting the new methodology and we'll be discussing this also with the focal points in countries, for SDG focal points in countries. And then once we, uh, we have established a robust methodology, we will discuss this with the WGGI for the recommendation and uh, for potential endorsement, for hopeful endorsement by the IAG. And with this, I, uh, I stop here and I thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. Bye bye. Thank you very much um, for that, Lorenzo, and thank you very much to all of our participants and attendees here today. Uh, to, to reassure, uh, all documents will be uploaded to the uh, Statistical Commission's uh, website um, for, the, for this side event. Uh, the roadmap, the implementation guide uh, are available right now, uh, as is the story map. So um, we would like to wish you a good day wherever you are in the world, and we look forward to hearing from you very soon. Thank you very much. Good day.